That gets your goat. Big Anklovich and Rish Outfield get my goat. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklovich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Good night, folks. <laughs> the end. Uh, okay, so here we are back with another one of our world famous movie reviews. Everybody's talking about them these days. It's summer movie season, and uh, we're talking Star Wars, which it seems really weird to me to be doing because wasn't it? I mean, I swear it was less than six months ago that we talked Star Wars the last time. Is that true? Yeah. In fact, the episode of Delusions of Grandeur with you and Renee that we recorded in December just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You guys are uh, really fitting in with the Doonstief family in the, with that kind of editing and posting speed. <laughs> I, I was just on my way to air that episode, but I got a little sidetracked. It's not my fault. <laughs> right, Jabba. Let me step on your tail now. You probably won't mind. That's a good segue to what we're talking today, because today we're talking Solo, a Star Wars story. Ooh, do they still do that? I saw it. It is called Solo, a Star Wars story. Yuck, dude. Yeah, I saw it on the title card or whatever you call it. I don't know if they include that in the official title of the movie, like the X-Men Origins Wolverine kind of a thing or something, but... Uh, I, I suppose people have gotten used to that whole thing at this point. I mean, this is the second one of these A Star Wars stories. I'm assuming they'll keep doing that, probably. I don't know. Maybe they won't. I don't know. It, how big of a deal was it to people trying to explain to them, hey, this is not continuity. We're back to when Han Solo was younger, blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that this was as vexing to people as Rogue One was. I actually spoke to people that thought that Jin Erso was Ray. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, so there's people that went to the movie without even realizing? No, just in the, the weeks or months leading up to that release. Ah, okay. People didn't understand that it was set during the dark times. Mm. As was this one. But I felt like this one was all about that. It was all about a young Han Solo. There's no confusion in the audience that this is a sequel to The Force Awakens. Yeah, and especially since they keeled him off, nobody's going to think, oh, this is him still. So, although we'll talk a little bit about something like that a little bit later. So yeah, what did you think of this show? Do we give our review first, or do you want to talk about the other thing first. We might as well just give our review right here. It's something that you and I have talked about on this show time and time again is lowered expectations. <laughs> and the lowered expectations. And the beautiful thing that that is. In fact, I may say that lowered expectations helped this movie more than any movie I can think of. There was a lot of talk of there being like big problems with the movie and stuff, wasn't there? I mean, like, I heard... So I can't remember, somebody told me that they had, like, had to hire an acting coach to come in and, like, work with the dude who played Han Solo because apparently he sucked that bad. And they had to do a bunch of reshoots and so on and so forth. Is that true? Any of that stuff? Or was was that just... Uh, I, I, too, have heard the uh, acting coach rumor. And as far as I know, that's just a rumor. But definitely, Ron Howard was brought in after the directors were fired. And according to Ron Howard, he was told to reshoot 80% of the movie. And he ended up only shooting 70% over. <laughs> Very economical. Because he felt there were scenes, there were action sequences, there were moments that was like, well, I couldn't do any better than this. This is fine. Let's just leave this in. It would be really interesting to see this film like on a Blu-ray and have it designate which were original shoot scenes and which were reshoot scenes. I mean, it just, I'm super curious about that. Like Rogue One before it, where it had reshoots and apparently a significant tonal change. 
This was just like a radical redo of the film where, I mean, I've heard that the Lego movie guys version, you know, was completely different. The tone was different. The, their goals of what kind of movie to make was different. And, and I don't imagine we'll ever see any of that because we didn't really see any of the Rogue One abandoned plot lines, uh, you know, Jyn Erso was always in the rebellion for in the original version, and she's sort of forced to join the rebellion in the version that we saw, things like that. I guess they feel like there's no benefit to us seeing things that were, that they, they second guessed. Uh-huh. But you hear stuff like that, and then you and I, and, and you know what, I'm not even going to lump you into that. I couldn't stop complaining about them not giving up the May release date. <laughs> when they fired these guys, when they almost started from scratch, to the point where like they let some of the actors go and said, you are no longer in Solo. We're recasting your parts. That's significant a change. And yet they said, no, it's still going to make its Memorial Day release date. We're just going to throw $50 million more at the budget so that it doesn't miss its release date. And I couldn't stop complaining about that. I was just like, guys, five months is too short a time in between Last Jedi and a new Star Wars movie. You have done really well with the December releases. Just bump it to December. Nobody is going to complain. Nobody. But they didn't do it. So I think the budget on this sucker was around $300 million, which is a tremendous amount of money to have to make back. And they're just making life harder for themselves, I felt like. And so I was kind of skeptical going into the movie. It just, I also didn't anticipate this one nearly as much as the others. I just, I, I think the big culprit is too soon, guys. Too much Star Wars too soon. You and I talked after we saw Rogue One. You and I went out to the parking lot and you said, dude, it's starting to be not special <laughs> to have these things every year. Uh-huh. Star Wars movies used to be a big deal. It's just like, holy cow. Oh, this is a Star Wars year. Yes. Something to look forward to. But now, yeah, having two in a six-month stretch. <sighs> Anyhow, those all contributed to me going to it and expecting, well, it's probably not going to be very good. Yeah, all of that stuff does lower the expectations quite a bit. I did worry about that. But as we've said before, with the lowered expectations, it's so much easier to be pleasantly surprised. It's so much easier to go, hey, wow, that, hey, that was fun, man. That was neat. And that's how I felt seeing Solo, a Star Wars story. I don't think I'll ever call it that again. Hit me if I do. <laughs> but I saw the movie... And about halfway through, I realized I was having a really good time. Mm -hmm. And the movie ended, and I thought, dang, man, that was fun. And uh, I don't think you can say The Last Jedi was fun. Regardless of your liking or disliking for it, it was not fun. And Rogue One was certainly not fun. You know, a movie where every single character gets killed at the end. <laughs> and so this one, with a lighter tone and maybe appealing to a slightly younger audience and there were less uh, I don't want to say expectations there's a there's a better word but there was less writing on this movie than on one of the saga films if that's what we're going to call our numbered episodes and there was less writing on this one than Rogue One can a movie uh, succeed without Luke Skywalker in it. Can a movie succeed without, you know, all these characters kind of thing? What happens if this bombs? And it, and with Solo, I felt like there was a little bit more breathing room, a little bit less expected of it. And so I walked out thinking, dang, man, I had a really good time at this movie. I would be happy to see this again, and I would be even happier to see another movie just like this. Yeah, I have to say that I totally agree with you. I had a really good time watching the film. It was fun. Uh, I have heard some people say, is it Star Wars if it doesn't have Jedi? And I guess it sort of did. But 
it didn't seem like it was a problem that there wasn't a bunch of force talk over and over and over again in this film. It, you know, I think that it's okay in these side stories, the Star Wars stories, is that what they called it? A, a Star Wars story? These uh, other ones don't need to have the Jedi. It's okay if they do have them in a background capacity, or I don't know, I guess it depends on what the Star Wars stories are. If they actually go through with the Yoda biopic, um, <laughs> then that will have lots of Jedi in it. But uh, but yeah, this Solo one, I, I really enjoyed it. So I don't think it was really an issue uh, as far as that goes. It still felt very Star Wars-y. You know, it just felt like certain parts of Star Wars, you know, instead of other certain parts. And it, I, I don't feel that it was missing anything because of that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of fun to be had in it. There was a lot of HBO actors to be had in it. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I just enjoyed it. It's, uh, I don't know how Ron Howardy it was. I, ha I guess I used to be a, a relatively big fan of Ron Howard stuff, probably stemming from how much I liked Willow when I was younger. I really liked it. I like fantasy things, and that was pretty much it for fantasy when I was younger. I think it wasn't until Dragon Heart. Is that what the movie was called? I am the last one. I think when that one came along and it was such a, you know, CG fest back when CG was enough to excite people that that movie, despite not really being a big deal, managed to out-earn Willow. It was the first movie to do that in that genre. And up until that point, Willow was the highest grossing fantasy film. You know, obviously there have come others since then, a certain trilogy of movies about short guys with hairy feet has uh, long destroyed its record. But those movies weren't nearly as fun as Willow was. Willow had more fun to it, you know, it was happier. And, and that definitely, I think, comes along with this. I, I liked Ron Howard's stuff a lot. I saw Far and Away when that came out, and I really enjoyed that one. I don't know when I stopped caring about Ron Howard's movies. Apollo 13 was really good, um, but that's probably the last one I could name that was his. Did he do A Beautiful Mind? He did. Okay, so I guess that's the last one that I can name was his, but I did not like A Beautiful Mind very much. That one wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's, it's hard to examine seriously the mind of someone who has a serious mental illness and have a lot of fun. So there's that. But yeah, I don't know what he's done since then. He, I, I'm sure he has to have done something. Well, but he did the, uh, the Dan Brown... Movies with Tom Hanks, the Da Vinci Code series. Oh, yeah. You didn't see any of those? I don't think I did ever see any of those. I did read the book, but movies just didn't interest me, I guess. Did you, uh, sorry to derail you, but uh, were you happy to see Willow again in this film? <laughs> of course I was. How could I not be? Come on, he was Willow, he was Wicket, he was... Professor, which, uh, shoot, which professor was he? Dee, doo, dee, doo, Flitwick. Dee. That is correct. He was, oh, he, he was probably that really annoying guy in the prequels that was the baby Greedo. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've, I've had so much joy from Willow over the years that I, how could I not be happy to see him? Okay, cool. Yeah, there was a lot to like. I really liked Donald Glover as Lando Calrissian in this show. He was fun. I liked that they really got into his character and, you know, just kind of portrayed him as a peacock. And, you know, he had a whole closet full of capes. Of capes. And I'll have to say that here and there, Donald Glover overdid Billy D. Williams kind of way of beautiful woman here Ugh, that kind of schlitz malt liquor way of speaking <laughs> what was it wasn't he on schlitz commercials or was it i felt like it was colt 44 or something that's why i turned to the great taste of colt 45 was it colt 
I can't remember, but anyways, just his smarmy thing. He did a lot of that tone or whatever, which I suppose, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Truthfully, the guy who played Han Solo was a little too smiley. He was a little too not Han Solo, although maybe that was kind of supposed to be what happened in this movie, is that he learned to be a little more... I was gonna say he learned to be a little more cynical and, you know, think of himself a little bit more, but I don't think he really did. He was a way more heroic Han Solo in this movie than we had in Star Wars. He, in Star Wars, he was an ass. And it wasn't until the very end when he finally, you know, had his change of heart and was less of a, I think of myself, as long as I get my money, that's all that matters to me, sweetheart. I don't know what that means. I mean, this, his character had a huge step back between the end of this film and the start of the uh, next one that he appears in. But yeah, I don't know. I thought that, that guy needed to be a little less smiley, a little less goofy and happy, and a little more cynical to be Han Solo. But I don't know. Did you think that way or did it, did it even matter to you? Did you forget? I mean, I didn't think about that as I was watching wasn't until after when I started saying, huh, I don't know. Well, there's a scene where Daenerys Targaryen says that uh, she, she knows what Han really is, and that's a good guy. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was a decision that they made. Okay, we've decided to interpret the Han Solo character in this way, that deep down, he is a good guy. And maybe what happens over the next 15 or so years beats that part of him down deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't know. But they did establish that he was a super heroic, square-jawed, decent person. And he had the opportunity to be selfish and make decisions that were petty. And he continually rejected those and would, you know, take the higher road. And again, I, I just, I felt like that was a decision they made, a conscious decision that we're not making a movie about an anti-hero here. We're making a movie about a good guy. And I don't know if it was for kids. This movie felt so much more for kids than the others have. But, I mean, you do get that scene at the end where he shoots first. And it's he definitively shoots first. <laughs> and I thought yeah, that was intentionally I've... there as well as a callback, as a, a reminder <laughs> When I first saw that, for some reason, I thought somebody behind him had shot. Oh, interesting. Because you don't actually see it happen. It took me a second to go, oh, okay, so there's not anybody running up the hill. That was him that shot. Okay. Ah. I guess that uh, makes sense, but not necessarily in the movie that we've watched does it make sense. But as far as your point, and I'm not saying it's a criticism, I don't think you were saying it's a criticism, or maybe you were. The point of what, Han Solo being too nice, or what he... Uh, yeah, this is not the Han Solo that we know in, I'll call it A New Hope. Yeah, it's not really a criticism, because I liked the movie. Han Solo's character was a nice character. I didn't have a problem with his character. It's just that it's not the same character that we know from the next movie. When it hits, he's going to be so much more cynical and not the guy that we saw in this movie. So... You can complain about that. I didn't really care. Okay, well, no, no. I'm just saying, if you were complaining about that, I, I have had the impression for a number of years now, ever since they announced this movie, that they were hoping that this is the start of a Han Solo series and that we would see him continue to evolve into the guy that says, I ain't in it for your revolution, mind you. I expect to be well paid. And so, you know, they gave him a little bit more room left to travel. But I've talked to other people that are like, no, this is one and done, dude. This is supposed to fill in like Han's whole backstory. And I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, when I saw this, though, the, when it was over, I was like, ooh, I hope we get to see more of these. And ooh, I hope they spin Lando off into his own series and we get to see more with him. And uh, I still feel that way. I think it would be great yeah. to see more of Han Solo. I would like to see how they do Jabba the Hutt. 
CG. <laughs> and how they can sprinkle in a little bit more nastiness, for lack of a better word, into Han's character. I, I, I don't think... Maybe it was the episode with you and me and Marshall and Renee where we talked about the character of Han Solo and how nasty can he be before we say, okay, this is not a good guy. Before somebody like George Lucas says, okay, we need to change this so that kids don't think that he is a murderer. Right. And I have a pretty high threshold. You can have a character be pretty dang nasty and I will still root for him. But yeah, I kind of expected that we would see him stick his neck out for somebody in this movie and have, have him get bitten so that he's less likely and less likely and less likely in the future to stick his neck out. Until eventually, yeah, he becomes that guy who Leia says is quite a mercenary. I wonder if he cares about anything. Mm-hmm. Or anybody, you know. And maybe, spoiler alert, everybody, if you haven't seen it, turn it off now. Maybe when Daenerys Targaryen leaves him at the end, that's the beginning of that. You know, you had him and his girl and all his dreams of being together and having their ship together and doing their thing together. And she's just like, fuck you, I got shit to do. And goes off to do her thing. Maybe that's his heart getting stomped on. And starting him down that road. Although he seemed awful happy with Chewie after that. And getting the ship and all that stuff. So, who knows? Well, if this turns out to be the only Han Solo film, then, yeah, there'll probably be a gap in the character that you're just required to fill in on your own. Or you can just plain reject it and say, that's not my Han Solo in that movie. But if miracles occurred and they were able to make three or four more of these, they left the Kira character, they left Daenerys, Mother of Dragons, alive and with her own agenda and with her own things going on, that's a huge question mark. It feels like they intended to follow that up in the future. Did you not get that impression, too? Especially with the reveal at the end of who she served. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like that is obviously a possibility. Now, you were telling me before that maybe it won't be, because has this film not done well? The box office for this movie is less than they expected, am I right? Well, that's an understatement, sir. The okay. Well, I mean, we can start talking about that, but if you want to continue on this positive note, talking about how much we liked the film, you always like to talk about the music. I wouldn't mind talking about that. And I also wanted to talk about that cameo appearance. Okay, well, let's talk about that stuff first then, and, and we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the cameo appearance instead right now. Okay, and, and people probably know what we're talking about, right? Uh, well, it's not uh, Edrio Two Tubes we're talking about. <laughs> I'll mention it, and then, then they'll know what we're talking about when I get to it, because I can't talk about it by not talking about it. So, yeah, the cameo appearance that you were talking about a minute ago, who she serves... It, it is revealed that Darth Maul is somebody that she's working for, I guess, down the line. Now, I have to admit that it was interesting to see Darth Maul again. So there's that. He was way more talkative just in the one <laughs> little scene that he got than the entire uh, movie that he was in before. I think he got like three lines or two lines in all of uh, Phantom Menace. And in this one, he's just like, oh, yeah, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and why don't you come see me, and yeah, we're going to, oh, let's go. Woo! Sit, 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 sit. Which was interesting. Uh, didn't quite fit with what he was like before. He was uh, just a, a quiet dude that had a double-bladed lightsaber. The problem that I had with that, uh, first of all, before we get to the problem, what did you think? Did you like seeing Dark Maul? Well, see, I didn't know who they were talking about. They were really careful not to say anything but he. Uh huh. And so my assumption was, okay, this is Jabba the Hutt they're talking about. And then when the hologram started and it was a hooded figure, 
I was just like, oh my goodness, Emperor Palpatine? That's rad. And it wasn't him. He takes down the hood. And yeah, it was Darth Maul. And there were three or four people in the audience that cheered at that. I sort of stared at him for a second because I was just like, wow, that he looks so different. And I guess, you know, 19 years later, Ray Park is not going to look exactly the same. They probably didn't make him shave his head again for a one-day job. Uh huh. Not that it would matter to him. What else is he doing? <laughs> no, that's a good point. But it, for me, it was just like, oh, well, that affects the timeline like crazy. And then he stood up and he had his mechanical legs. And I thought, oh, okay, so this is the Darth Maul from the Clone Wars cartoon and from the Rebels cartoon. All right. That's interesting. I, oh, I, so he had mechanical legs. Right. I didn't realize that. I didn't notice that when he stood up. And so this whole time I've been sitting here going, this, this makes no sense at all. <laughs> they need Deadpool to come back in time and just shoot him to fix the timeline because this doesn't make any sense. He was cut in half and killed... At the end of The Phantom Menace, which means this movie has to happen before The Phantom Menace, but it couldn't have, because the whole time they're talking, join the Empire, let's go Empire. You know, oh, wow. Get into the infantry now. So it's obviously not that. It has to be after the Empire, which is after the last of the Clone Wars. So it didn't make any sense to me. I was, I was raging. You can't be the only one, though, because they, they did not go out of their way to let you know that this was an undead Darth Maul who is now half robot from the cartoons. It was subtle, the, the robot legs. And it wasn't until I saw the robot legs that I realized, oh, okay. But if I hadn't seen them, yeah, this movie takes place, what, 25 years too soon? Yeah, well, it's funny because I'm not the only one. I saw on Facebook somebody ask... Hey, how old is Han Solo supposed to have been at the start of the Star Wars movie? Because if this movie that I just saw is what I think it is, he had to have been like 55, 60 years old when that movie started. And everybody's like, ah, I think he was supposed to be maybe his late 20s. So I'm not the only one that was confused by that. But yeah, I was just like, come on. You've got to be kidding me. This doesn't make any sense. Now, truthfully, uh, throwing in a caveat to that, I like Star Wars a lot, but I am not a super Star Wars nerd. I don't read the Star Wars books. I mean, I, I think I did read, what, the uh, Thrawn trilogy back in the day. I have read a tiny bit. I did see the Ewok Adventure but I haven't seen the Clone Wars cartoon movie or any of the cartoon, the CG cartoon. The, like the first episode I watched of that and those damn battle droids were so fucking annoying that I just turned it off. I couldn't take it anymore. They were like Jar Jar. Mechanical Jar Jars, each one of them going around. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, say something, something funny now. <laughs> Except for it'll only be funny for a six-year-old. So I couldn't watch those and haven't watched Rebels. I've heard that I should, that it would be worth it, but I haven't. I did hear that somewhere in there they brought Darth Maul back with robot legs, and I just, I was not a fan of that idea. <laughs> I mean, the dude was cut in half. He was clearly, and he, then he fell dozens of stories at least down to the bottom where you can't see where he hits. So the guy was pretty clearly dead. So yeah, bringing him back is just one of those things like, oh, come on. Why would you resurrect this character? But I guess we're going with that. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, it's been so long. I mean, I've had 12 years or so to get used to it. And plus, I, I enjoyed this, the Darth Maul interactions on Rebels. He longs for revenge on Obi-Wan Kenobi, but nobody knows what became of Obi-Wan Kenobi after the Clone Wars. People just assume that he's dead, and, and he wants revenge. And I guess, yeah, he wants revenge for killing him. But, uh, yeah, he finally figures out where old Ben is, and he goes to Tatooine, and uh, they have, like, their, what do you call it, uh, final showdown. 
and I, I was quite delighted by that episode, by going to see Tatooine again. And then we find out what Obi-Wan is doing on that planet at the end of that episode. And of course, you and I already know, because we've seen Star Wars, but this show takes place before Star Wars. It just ended in this really wonderful way. And uh, they could have done Darth Maul's resurrection worse, I think. Yeah. But uh, it is interesting that they expect the audience to be diehard enough fans to understand that. Right. That it's a resurrected, that it's a reborn, whatever you want to call it, that it's Darth Maul redux rather than Darth Maul (laughs) Phantom Menace. And I can see that upsetting people if they didn't make that realization. And and I guess it it did have you super upset. Yeah, and I'm not a non-fan. I'm guessing that the same thing will happen to all of my kids because they haven't seen any of that stuff and they're less of a fan by far than me, but they will recognize Darth Maul. And they'll be like, oh, wait, uh, you know, it's just, it's confusing. <laughs> There's just no other way to say it. I don't think it was a good idea. I think they could have gone with somebody else. I don't know who. Uh, they should have had Bosk be the guy. Oh, did you light up when they mentioned Bosk in this movie like I did? <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh. I did. I did like that they mentioned him. I elbowed my cousin so hard, he had to go <laughs> up and seek medical attention. And so he missed the whole death of Tandy Newton's character. Oh, that's too bad. Spoiler. Yeah. Uh, I just, I loved that they said boss. Oh my gosh, because you know me, I, I aspire to be the greatest fan of boss, and I continually fall short. Yeah, it's really hard. But it's good to have goals. You do have a Bosque mask, and you have the hands, too, right? I do. Yeah. Unfortunately, see, it's made for someone who is full human height. So I was unable to wear them. But Yeah, that's too bad. Let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, and I'm sure you would have mentioned it eventually, but the score was by... I pause so you can tell me, because I can't remember. <laughs> John Powell. Right, right. He did the score, but it used John Williams' themes, and Williams composed a new theme for the character of Han Solo. And so I wondered, because you're my, uh, you're my illicit lover? No, you're my <laughs> musical score expert. That's what it was. Sorry, they confused those things. Oh, boy. Uh, and so I figured I would ask you... Well, what did you think of the music? And what did you think of the new John Williams theme? Uh, I enjoyed it. I don't know what the new theme was, though. Which part was the new theme that was John Williams? I just assumed it was not, none of it was John Williams. So what was the part that was the John Williams part? Was it the one that was kind of like, I thought of it as being the love between Solo and Kira theme? Would that be the one you're speaking of, or is it something else? Maybe. I mean, they introduced it at the very beginning of the movie, and mm-hmm. I think that was Han and Kira running around. But And they played it a lot, but I'd like to see the movie again so I could say, oh, okay, there it is, and there it is, and there it is. Like One thing that they brought back that we haven't had in 40 years was they brought back the original Empire theme, which was... Uh, how, do, how did that go? The dun, 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 dun. Uh-huh. That that was the theme of the Empire in the, A New Hope. Uh-huh. And we haven't heard it repeated because it was replaced by the Imperial March. Right. They played the Imperial March, too, as basically like the, let's recruit soldiers. <laughs> Look, you could be. Yes, but they played a major key right. version of it rather than a minor yeah, key. Like the... And that delighted me because <laughs> I was just like, oh, I can. Yeah, uh... I was like, didn't you say that there was an episode of that cartoon where it was like Empire Day and everybody was like celebrating how great it was to be in the Empire? And Oh, you're right. And they were playing the Imperial March all as like, this is the national anthem and stuff. I think it was an episode of Rebels where it was like Emperor Palpatine Day or something like that. On this date, so and so many years ago, the Empire was formed and yeah, everybody had to stand to attention and listen to a a jaunteer version of dun, 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 dun. And that was early, early on in uh, Star Wars Rebels. But yeah, I wanted to say with John, I mean, the, the one thing that I noticed, the theme that really 
jumped out at me was the part where they're flying through that maelstrom, whatever it was called, and uh, you totally hear the uh, asteroid theme in there. The dun 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 when he has that kind of triumphant moment in the asteroid belt. I like to hear that. That's, that is one of my favorite parts. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talked about that in Last Jedi. Williams would bring back something that he had used before, and it could either remind you of that moment, you know, it's like, hey, this is like this, or it's like a counterpoint to that moment. It's like uh, Luke is dying, and we hear the music that played when he was young and longing for a better life. That's something that, well, I mean, when you create these themes, you can do that. You can do a major key version to create a different feel. That sort of stuff is really fun. And uh, eventually we will have no more John Williams music and uh, yeah. the world will be a grayer place because of it. We'll always have what he's already done so far, so there is that. He's created quite a body of work for us to remember him by. I, and I think they played Duel of the Fates when we saw Darth Maul as well. <laughs> Am I wrong? That would be, I, don't, I didn't notice it, but that would be cool if they did. Okay, so I, I liked the movie a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I loved the movie, but it felt like not everything was counting on this movie. Like, it wasn't the tent pole that they needed to make a billion dollars on. It's just like, hey, let's make a fun movie with less writing on it. Whereas, like, the movie that comes out next year, episode nine, the last episode, ostensibly the last episode, that's got a great deal writing on it because it has to tie up all the loose ends of the Ray. Kylo Ren, Poe Dameron, Finn story, but it also has to tie a bow on the Star Wars saga as a whole if they choose to end it there and say, okay, this is it. Everything from this point on is going to be different. It's going to be the Game of Thrones guys doing their movies. It's going to be Ryan Johnson doing his. But as far as the Skywalker saga, this is it. And so I think there's so much pressure and so much weight on something like that. But on this, I had a good time, and that's all I needed. Mm -hmm. I had a good time, and I want to see it again. And for me, that's a success. But was it as impactful? Was it as memorable? Was it as weighty as Force Awakens or Phantom Menace or, you know, one of these really important Star Wars films? No. It wasn't. But I don't know that all movies have to be like that. Just, for example, Ant-Man and the Wasp comes out in like 10 minutes. And only a crazy person would expect the same kind of result as Avengers 3, you know, or Thor Ragnarok or something like that for an Ant-Man movie. Or Black Panther. It's like, you got to lower your expectations, go there, and if it's fun, then, it's, then they succeeded. Yeah. And I feel like that's the way any of these a Star Wars story should be. They don't need to be the greatest thing ever, you know, the biggest money-making trilogy ever. When they branch out, they're going to have to do that. It can't always be that. And if they can't be happy with that, uh, I guess that might be the death knell of Star Wars. I don't know. Uh, how much longer can they keep doing the saga before they you know, have to really start branching out into other stuff. Well, I suppose when it comes down to it, Disney's already made their money back, but I'm sure Disney would like to keep making money from all that they spent to acquire Star Wars. So they don't want to just let it lie fallow for 30 years again. The one thing that does kind of bum me out about Darth Maul being in there is just, yeah, now they've completely legitimize those darn uh, prequels. <laughs> I still have that like fantasy in my mind that down the line they're going to remake the three uh, prequels anew and this time they won't suck. You know, they'll 
say, no, that, that stuff, you could forget about those. These are the real, this is the real story of how Darth Vader became Darth Vader. <laughs> That's what those Game of Thrones guys are working on right now. A trilogy of the rise of Darth Vader. Really? No, no, I'm joking. Huh. Oh, darn. But I was just like, yeah, you get these guys who, who know what they're doing with something really dark and really rough. Yeah. And it's like, okay. So, you know, with those guys, I would hope that they do something set a thousand years ago. Something like that where it has absolutely no characters that we know and introduce just a whole new world. And there can be Sith and there can be Jedi if they want as long as uh, we get all sorts of intrigue and a bunch of them die and there are surprises and stuff and they don't play it safe, I think those movies will be fine. Yeah, they could do something like the birth of the Jedi, you know, when somebody first becomes a Jedi or something like that. That would have to be way back when, I would assume. Yeah, the, well, actually, the sky's the limit. I can't, I can't quote obi-wan like you can but what what does obi-wan say about the jedi for over for a thousand? thousand generations the jedi were guardians of peace that's a really long time wait was that not the no that sounds right but that's i was hoping it would say a thousand years and not a thousand generations because a thousand generations is like twenty thousand years I, but i, I that, that's neat because you could go anywhere if jedi have been around for that long then you can make a movie before there was star travel yeah. that have Jedi in it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, we want to make Game of Thrones, but with lightsabers. And they're like, okay. R really? Yeah. No. They're like, we want to make Star Wars, but with regular swords. <laughs> Anyhow, sorry about that. I, I guess I was just trying to put a positive note before we go to a dark place. Because... Even though all the things that I said I stand behind, they spent $300 million on this movie. And you have to make a billion dollars if you're going well, to. Well, I mean, I guess they're redoing the whole thing. Yeah, which leads me to believe they did think this was going to be a billion dollar grosser. This was going to be their tentpole film of this year. And... Uh, that's too bad, because there is room for a lower-budget, lower-scale Star Wars movie. Like, there has been talk about them doing an Obi-Wan Kenobi solo movie. You know what I mean by solo, right? Is there a better word? An, an Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi standalone movie. How's that? <laughs> yeah, you probably shouldn't use solo. And I think if they decided to do that, and, and it's up in the air now, keep it cheap. And keep it low-key. You don't have to have any Death Stars exploding in a movie about Obi-Wan Kenobi. Why not make it for $100 million? That's still a ton of money. That's more money than you and I and any of our listeners put together will ever see. Right. I, I feel like it doesn't cost a great deal to go out to the desert and make an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. But maybe they feel like audiences are so jaded that they have to see bigger space battles and bigger chases and bigger explosions and all that. It's not just Star Wars. We talk about it with everything. Fast and the Furious 7 had that car jumping from one building to the other, <laughs> and audiences are already bored with that. So Fast and the Furious 11 is going to have to have a car driving off the International Space Station. And, you know, it and just, just free-falling all the way down and then not pulling the parachute until uh, they're within 100 feet of the ground. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes there's something to be said for just putting the brakes on and saying, hey guys, this is going to be a more intimate story. And maybe that, that's scary for some people. I totally felt that way watching the trailers that played before this Han Solo film. They played a trailer for a movie called Mowgli. Okay. Which was the darkest version ever of this story the darkest jungle book get ready to shit your pants i haven't seen a trailer for that oh it was stupid <laughs> why why are they making another version another live action with cg animals version of this movie 
what, a, it was a week ago that the last one came out? I mean, like, seriously, is there any... It, I looked at the calendar, it was 14 days, come on. Okay. It, is there really such a thirst for this story? There's just so many people that just love Rudyard Kipling that they can't wait until the next retelling, because it's not a new story, it's the same damn thing. Again. But yeah, it was super action-packed, and Mowgli's climbing a mountain cliff and he's fighting a, a bunch of people and he's running from monkeys and I don't know what it was just like dude you gotta be kidding me and what was the other one was it skyscraper by any chance with with the rock I also saw skyscraper which was another one where it was just like oh the rock is doing the insanest stuff here he jumped off of a crane to get into the building. And he's doing it with a fake leg because he only has one real leg because he got hit by an IED in, in Iraq or whatever. And truthfully, it may have been a trailer leading into Deadpool because Deadpool, I swear, that movie had like the most hardcore trailers ever of all these movies that were just like, this guy will kill 500,000 people all by himself in this movie. Get ready. And they had like the Mission Impossible Six, five, what are we on? Is it I five? think it's six. It's okay, Mission Impossible 6 trailer. Just all insanity that, yeah, a person would not survive. Doesn't matter how Ethan Hunty he is, he's not gonna live through that shit. And I'm, I'm old, so I, I can't speak for audiences of today, but I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go see any of those. They just look like bullshit, but Fast and the Furious was one of the biggest movies of the year worldwide last year, so I guess people like it. Well, you, about a year ago, you mentioned Dragonheart, and that in those days, <laughs> a CG talking dragon was a novelty. It's like, wow, ILM worked for two years on this thing. This is amazing, guys. We were satisfied with that, with just spectacle, with just CG. And you and I... I mean, it's been 21 years since Dragonheart, so we've gotten old, but that stuff doesn't do it for us anymore. The relationship between a man and his dragon would say something to us. Whereas, oh, look how impressive the CG dragon is. It's no longer impressive. You and I have to have a reason to care. We have to care about the people in the car stunt because we don't care how fast and furious the explosions are coming anymore. We've seen it all. Right. You and I are super, super jaded. Right. And maybe the kids haven't seen it all. And so some of that stuff still speaks to them, makes them excited. But you cannot stress character enough. I, I mean, it is so important for us to like a character, for us to root for a character, for us to fear for a character, that makes the difference between a successful movie and one that is something else, that is that is just a, a popcorn movie, as some people say. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the scenes in this movie with Han and Chewie, with Han and Kira, with Lando, the scenes that were building relationships worked. And so that's what I remember, that's what spoke to me, rather than the space battles and the, you know, the endless CG and the zillion planets unlike anything we've seen before. And the stuff with that, with a man becoming friends with another man, or a very hairy man in this case, that's cheap to film, but it's hard. Yeah. Whereas you can have 4,500 Croatian CG technicians working night and day to get your special effects done and uh, if that's all the audience wants, then you're successful there. I don't know. I liked the characters in this movie enough to want to see them again. And now I guess it's time to talk about the bad news. It did not do well. We live in a world where 90% of movies are made or broken with their opening weekend. Every once in a while you will get something like The Greatest Showman or like or Live, Die, Repeat, whatever that movie was actually called. Or uh, there was a movie last summer 
that was never number one at the box office, but it continually repeated its its business. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately, it ended up in the black. And I, was last year the Tarzan movie with Samuel L. Jackson and Margot Robbie? Or was that the year before? I don't know. I never saw that movie. That sounds like the year before, though. Well, every once in a while, you would get a movie that bucks the trend. And Greatest Showman is a fantastic example because it opened so pitifully. It, it just did not do well with its opening weekend. But the people that saw it liked it and talked about it, and the soundtrack actually sold, if you can believe that. And more people went and, and went and went and went, and, and two months later it was still in the first-run theaters. Huh. And you'd have to be a drooling idiot to proclaim that movie a flop. And so Force Awakens had a gigantic opening, and, and Rogue One had a, 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 a huge opening, and Last Jedi had a huge opening. But Solo did not. Its opening weekend was about 83 million, 84. Uh-huh. And Rogue One's opening was 134. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, geez, it's worse. 155. So we're talking almost half what Rogue One brought in. And Rogue One was not nearly as successful as the two movies with Rey and, and Darth Maul. Darth, what's his name? Ray and Kylo Ren in them. Darth, what it, does he have a name? Like a Darth name? He doesn't, does he? Kylo Ren is his Darth name. So anyhow, yeah, everyone at Disney has to be super disappointed with this. They expected maybe a, a $130 million, $150 million opening, and it's, it, it's, it looks like it's not even going to cross $100 million on its opening weekend. And I don't know if that is damning for the Star Wars series or for Lucasfilm or for... Probably not for Ron Howard. It is the biggest opening Ron Howard has ever seen. <laughs> His biggest up to this point was The Da Vinci Code, and this outstretched that. And so there are a bunch of people, and this is what I wanted to talk to you about yesterday when you were driving home, is that there are a bunch of people that are thrilled with this outcome. People that have become angry or bitter or jaded toward Disney or toward Kathleen Kennedy or toward Lucasfilm, and, and they rejoiced that this movie didn't do well. You and I have talked a lot about the naysayers of The Last Jedi, that there was a vocal contingent of Star Wars fans that hated that movie. Uh-huh. And they just wouldn't shut up about it. To the point where I don't know if there are a lot of people that hated it or just a few that will not stop with how much they hated it. But it seems like those folks were out in force with this, proclaiming this to be a loser, proclaiming this to be the end of the Star Wars stories. You know, it's like, oh gosh, what? maybe they'll cancel episode nine because of this. <laughs> You know, and, and there's a lot of people that are like, oh, yeah, they'll they'll fire Kathleen Kennedy for sure now. Yeah, okay, the the three previous movies she made made $4 billion, but let's fire her because Solo underperformed. I can't see the future. I don't know if Solo is going to be like The Greatest Showman, and people will say, hey, it wasn't that bad. I, I would go see it again. And other people will go see it and it will play, you know, all through the summer. And it will be one of those movies where it's just like, yeah, this should not have done so well based on how well it opened. But it, it ended up being very profitable for Disney. Or if, if this is the end, if the contracts that all those people signed for multiple solo movies are being torn up as we speak. And Ron Howard is, thanks, guy, uh, just, you know, pick up your check and, and uh, we're going to give your parking spot to somebody else. Um, I, I, I don't know, because I can't see the future. But I do know that they should not have released it in the summer. They should not have spent as much money as they did so that it would make its summer release date. And then it came out seven days after Deadpool and in the shadow of Infinity War, which both did extremely well this weekend. And my guess is a lot of that money would have gone Solo's way had it come out at a different time. Yeah, I'm sure that would have helped. Maybe giving it more time, like you were talking about all the people that are the backlash and, and stuff. 
with the people that didn't like Last Jedi, maybe if you waited a full year at least, that blows over. It is interesting. I, I guess I can kind of understand it because I do recall when the prequels came out after the first one, everybody was, was still, you know, they were like, oh, there were some problems with that, but they were still giving it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, after the second one came out, they were kind of like, oh, I really didn't like Anakin surfing on that stupid cow. And then <laughs> when it finally gets around to the third one, a lot of people were just like, no, I'm not even, I'm not going to see it. And, you know. Once the whole trilogy was done, people were just like, yeah, we probably need a break from Star Wars. Let, let's let it lie for a while, because everybody hates George Lucas now. And, you know, we're, we're to that point now. We're at, we just passed movie three, and this is movie four of the uh, new group. So I suppose people are going to start complaining. I mean, there were people that started complaining from the beginning and this time around. And you can't please everyone. You know, they, they, they expect it to live up to what the ones they saw in their childhood were, but the ones they saw in their childhood had nothing to be compared to. They were cultural phenomenons. They were unlike anything else that's just going to come around. It's not going to happen again, no matter what you do. And there's no way to catch lightning in the bottle twice. I do think it's kind of a shame that they wasted, you know, that they spent so much money on it that this might be a problem. I hope it doesn't turn out to be. I assume that they're far-sighted enough to be like, yeah, whatever, this one didn't do well, but that's okay. We got $690 million in the bank from Black Panther, another $650 50 million from the Avengers. The other, you know, they have so many things at Disney now that one little slightly underperforming Star Wars movie is not going to kill anything. It shouldn't be any problem whatsoever for them to just absorb that and keep on walking. They're like the Hulk right now, taking, a, you know, bullets. They just bounce off and just keep going. It, I can't imagine that it's really going to make much of a difference. Five or six in a row of these, something like that. Yeah, maybe they're going to be like, okay, well, I guess Star Wars played out. That's too bad. But uh, one is not going to do anything. All right. Well, it feels to me like we've said our piece. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we're done? Not on the air. Fire fist. Um, one other thing I didn't say is... We've got nothing coming out for a while. The second weekend action point and a drift are the big releases. Uh-huh. So I, I though that's not even a blip on the radar. The next week after that you get Oceans 8, the all girl Oceans 11. Uh-huh. And Hotel Artemis, which I I guess could make a dent. It's not until June 15th when you get Incredibles 2 that I think Solo has competition. Yeah. Um, and so it may do absolutely great for the next two weeks, three weeks. Yeah, that's true. That's one thing I was thinking. And, you know, you and I liked it. And I assume probably a lot of other people will. And they'll say, oh, yeah, it was really good. And then, you know, people that didn't go the first week will be going later. I don't know. Memorial Day weekend is supposed to be the big weekend. But things have shifted. I don't know. I was lucky to see it this week, to tell you the truth, because my son graduated from high school the day before, and we, you know, we were doing all sorts of stuff this weekend. The fact that I did manage to see it, kind of a surprise, truthfully. But um, I did my homework. Oh, dude. <laughs> I got a cease and desist from Death Row Records <laughs> for playing that drop from uh, Snoop Dogg, and now I have to, oh shoot, hopefully, just like everyone else, they don't listen to That Gets My Goat. Yeah, that's probably the case. So I guess there is a possibility that this thing could turn out to be just fine. It could be like, what was it called again? The, the Showman? 
<laughs> have you not heard of The Greatest Showman? The Greatest Showman, that's it, yeah. I, I've heard of it, yeah. I know the, the movie, I didn't see it. It didn't look interesting to me, but... Uh, A lot of people did pe see it. People went to it, so that's cool. Maybe it'll be like that. Well, we'll see. I mean, I imagine we'll have more episodes this summer. And so uh, we'll see if I'm right. We'll see if I'm wrong. We'll see if there are developments, there are repercussions on something like this. Um, I don't know if Kathleen Kennedy's career is in danger when you make a movie that underperforms. Yeah, some people have had one failure and it's over for them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you look at like M. Night Shyamalan, how many times did he make a turd and studios still sent money his way? True. And then eventually he makes something like Split that people did like, so. Yeah. I would think if Kathleen Kennedy did lose her job over this, she would not be looking long for a, a new job. There'd be all sorts of people going, ooh, 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 yeah, come here, come here. Yeah, I mean, eventually it's, it's gonna change. You know, somebody else is gonna step in and take over. It always happens, so we'll see how much longer that she can last. Okay, well, we, I guess time will tell. If anybody uh, is still listening, take your head out of the oven and go go do something positive with your day. That's right. It's a, it's a beautiful sunny day outside. It's summer, unless you're in the southern hemisphere and then it's not. But it's winter movie season for you guys. Go see all these great winter movies that are coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. I've been Big Anklovich. And I've been Rich Outfield, and uh, don't worry. Chewie and me have gotten out of much tougher situations than this. That's right. Live long and prosper. <laughs> and I'll get ice cream if I say this? That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. <laughs>